So the talk I wanted to do today um, was about heat and um, how to build environments with heat and um, actually go deeper into building scalable and highly available environments. And um, so I'm going to start a little bit with presentation and then we're actually going to go into hands-on lab where um, you're going to have to team up because there's quite a few people here. Um, and you'll try to launch a stack and um, see how that looks um, and how that actually works. Um, I was going back and forth into, okay, so what do I want to talk about? Do I want to jump in straight into tools and like talk about all the, you know, okay, so that's what we use for load balancers, that's what we use for um, databases and whatnot, or um, do I want to start slow? And uh, when they actually scheduled this talk as the first one, I figured I'll start slow and kind of give you a general overview of heat and other tools. Um, yeah, and there's a lot, actually, there's a lot of talks um, in the summit about heat and what it does. And um, there's, right after this one, there's a talk um, from actually heat core developers about the new features in Juno, which are really cool. So if you are interested in orchestration, you should definitely go to that one. Uh, but we'll start slow. And um, so when we deploy applications in production, they go through multiple stages. Um, so the first thing, before you deploy something, you have to get infrastructure, right? Um, so you have to get some environments, uh, well, some VMs, so some compute network storage, all of that to run. And um, well, after that is set up, typically you would install operating system, you would install um, the platform services. They are often called platform services. It just um, databases, maybe web servers, maybe um, anything else that um, your application needs, but it's not actual application code. It's Maybe it's PHP or Python or Django, whatever is your preferred, whatever your application requires. And then um, after that, the next stage is actually deploying application. And um, artifacts here is typically the application code itself. Um, there's config files, and at this stage, we also typically configure HA for those applications. When we have them up and running, or during configuration of those applications, um, there's some changes, some ad extra configurations to HA tool that happen. And then there's a work. So your application is up and running, it's all good, it's great, it's working. Hopefully it's working for a while, and um, hopefully this work stage is longer than the rest of them. That's ideal. And um, here there's a lot of data that gets collected. Um, so applications write logs, um, they produce metrics, um, history, and the actual data. And again, hopefully they run for a while, but at some point, um, almost every, well, every application fail. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a faulty application, it just, that's life. Um, and here, ideally what we want to know, get is we actually want to know when the application failed, and so we could either manually react to it or the tools that we use or the tool chain we use for monitoring could trigger some events to fix the application. Sometimes if it is an application fault, you have to patch or upgrade or write, do some code writing. <clears throat> when we um, talk about high availability for applications, there's the most common, you would hear a lot of things like active passive HA or active active HA. What's the difference there? Well, the difference there is that for active passive, um, even though you have multiple instances of application, there's only one active, there's one working. And the other one is deployed, ready to go, but it's not working. So when the, um, our main master application fails, the reaction is to start the second one. Active, active, both of them work. 
Both of them work simultaneously. They accept requests um, for data. You want to replicate or synchronize data between them. And when one of them fails, the other one still works. And that's, that's an ideal solution for us. Um, so when we look at this kind of application in production lifecycle, there's different tools and um, different groups of tools and names uh, people typically use. And if we kind of go and look at OpenStack and where OpenStack plays most of the time, so there is this provision resources, so provisioning compute, network, block storage, that's where the OpenStack open core programs work. Um, and heat helps here to orchestrate. During deploying platform services and um, deploying the application, um, you typically have some repositories. Either they're really defined or it's just somebody's laptop has a code that you have to SCP or something like that. Um, there's deployment tools that possibly help and they use this repository um, to deploy and to deploy the same configuration over and over. So there's also configuration management tools that um, help us in this stage. During the work stage, um, there's a lot of log. Well, there are typically applications do logging, and um, you want to collect that logging. Um, you don't really use it typically when the application is running because while well, it's running, why do I care? Um, you use it when the application fails because that's where the logs are typically analyzed, what is the reason of the failures and whatnot. Um, also during the work stage, um, you collect the metrics, possibly you plug in them somewhere like graphite so you can have pretty graphs to show you management. Again, nobody really cares if it works. Um, the only time people start caring if it fails. And um, this work-fail stage is where Solometer in OpenStack plays a crucial role because it collects the metrics and it also allows to trigger a reaction to those. Monitoring tools, um, Solometer is a relatively new project program in OpenStack that um, gets more and more features, more and more functionality. There's still a lot of things missing. Um, it helps you to monitor the cloud resources, but on the side of the underlying hardware infrastructure, there's a lot of work that's still not there. Um, so if you really want to have everything covered, you're probably gonna have to run some extra monitoring tools. And um, work stage is also, again, where if we have multiple instances of application, that's where the replication, so the data is synchronized between them. Maybe you take backup, um, maybe not. <coughs> and it's all good until it actually fails. So if we look here, um, heat and um, helps us on this initial stage of provisioning resources, it also helps with deployment. Um, HEAT by itself doesn't really deploy applications on top of VMs. Um, we'll see what helps HEAT to do that or what HEAT can trigger, but uh, by itself, if we just take the straight HEAT, it's not actually doing anything on your virtual machines. Um, so what is HEAT? Um, there is a definition that you can find on um, OpenStack.org in OpenStack documentation where implement, HEAT implements an orchestration engine to launch multiple composite cloud applications based on templates in the form of text files that can be treated like code. Long. Um, I have my own definition of HEAT that was kind of collected from um, multiple resources. A lot of them are OpenStack.org documentation. A lot of them are not, and um, where HEAT is a template-driven agent that helps deployers, so people who deploy things, um, deploy the infrastructure and trigger deployments of applications. When we look at HEAT um, 
um, architecture, heat consists of uh, several demons. So there's heat API and heat API CFN. Um, both of them are web servers. They accept requests. They process this, those requests by sending them to a message queue for a heat engine. So heat engine is actually the main, that's the worker guy, that's the busy guy. So APIs, um, they are really, um, again, just restful web servers that don't really do a lot of things. Um, heat engine is the one that does all the work deploying infrastructure. And it does that by talking to OpenStack services. So it talks to all of the OpenStack services, other services like Nova, Cinder, and Neutron to create resources and um, to create what's called a heat stack. So stack is a combination of multiple things and multiple resources um, that the environment um, typically consists of. Heat also works closely with Solometer. Um, because they kind of, they add to each other. So heat can create solometer metrics and alarms and whatnot, whereas solometer alarms can lead to something happening with heat. Um, and in the end, we have our cloud resources, which are, again, computes, so VMs, networks, storage, whatnot, that um, are kind of managed by heat and um, monitored and metered by um, Solometer. <clears throat> so if we look at, the, at heat from the point of view of virtual machine, I mentioned that heat by itself doesn't really do anything on your virtual machines. So typically um, on the virtual machine, there's a number of scripts or tools or daemons or whatever that run that get the information from heat and then um, they work, they apply that work on the VM locally. Um, one of the, I guess, most, not common, um, simple, not simple, um, something that um, you can find in a lot of references and uh, when people talk about like heat and here's template, um, they use images that have CFN tools. So CFN tools is a collection of multiple scripts um, that you install in the image and that they can talk to heat. Um, so heat can talk to them to um, give instructions and they can talk back um, to give either signals or which are, hey, something happened, um, that heat can continue processing its stacks. When uh, we look at HIT, so it's a template-based engine. So HIT operates on templates, and template typically consists of three main parts. So parameters, which is optional, those are some variables you want to include in your template. So if you want to reuse the same template over and over, um, you possibly want to have something that user is going to enter. Um, again, if we take like one of the examples a lot of um, articles talk about is work, WordPress applications, and it makes you enter a bunch of parameters, including database passwords and whatnot. So that's the um, part of the template where you um, define the input parameters for your um, template. The main part is resources. So it's a description of OpenStack entities, OpenStack resources um, that Heat creates and um, joins them together um, and operates on them. And then in the end, you can have outputs. Again, outputs are optional. Um, it's some extra information that um, you want to give back to the user after the stack or the environment is deployed. Um, when we try to apply heat to a scalable applications, so there's two useful features. Um, so one is heat auto scaling. Um, heat auto scaling um, is a feature that allows you to specify and template a scaling group. Um, a scaling group is a set of resources. 
that either um, that you apply the scaling policy to. So again, you can identify different scaling policies. You can say, well, I want to grow or I want to reduce size of my, um, the number of resources. And um, for auto scaling, another important part is integration with some, something like Solometer or CloudWatch that is actually going to uh, monitor those resources and trigger the policy. And the way how those Solometer alarms and um, the heat resources, how they can know about each other is because when you create the solometer alarm, you just add metadata to it. And that's the connection. That's the missing connection. Um, so that's kind of a little bit short about heat. Um, so we're going to move to the hands-on part. Um, there is quite a few people here. Um, I don't really have that many environments. Um, I also have good news and bad news. So good news, you are actually going to get environments and you're going to launch stack. Um, bad news, I broke the floating IPs. Um, so when you get the stack up and running, it returns you web server IP address, the floating IP, it's not going to be available. So that's kind of bad news. Um, the environment we're going to spin up is um, relatively simple, where you have a two-tier application, so it consists of web server and database. And uh, web server, um, there's two VMs. Each of them just runs Apache. They are front-ended by neutron load balancer. And that's where the floating IP was supposed to be attached. Well, it is attached. It's just not, available, not accessible over port 80. Um, there is Solometer Alarm that um, gets created for that group. And um, the web servers, they connect to databases. And um, the databases, there's also two of them. So it's two VMs, and they are behind the load balancer. So whenever um, one of them fails, the other one is accept still accessible because connect connection happens over the virtual IP of load balancer. Um, After we kind of start the environments, because it's going to take a little bit of time to provision all the resources, um, I'll talk a little bit about like problems I personally had with that, and like what you know, what I personally don't like. And uh, most of well, all of that talk is my personal opinion. Um, but um, let's get to it. So I have 35 environments. And it's a lot more than 35 people here. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to join into groups of like four, five people. Maybe. <laughs> I'll do, so I'll do mine on the screen as a demo. Uh, but um, also, some of you can actually get your own to play with. So if you open your web browser and go to that URL, um, you'll get to the page that asks for name, email. Um, you can enter whatever. It's really just a unique identifier, so we can give you a unique environment. Um, and then it, this page is going to return you the information and how to log into Horizon and where the heat um, template is. And uh, open the heat template, and I'll go through it a little bit, and I'll talk what is happening on every stage, and then we can launch it. For those of you who are not going to get environment after they run out, um, you can still get like just access the template, so you can see and follow what's happening, um, see what's happening in the template.
No, so um, it's going to be a heat number is a login, and then Paris is a password. It's login slash password, yeah. Okay, so um, for this particular demonstration, we're actually using two types of images. Um, so there is an um, image called Apache and an image called MariaDB. Um, so we're running that on Fedora. Um, Fedora 20 doesn't have MySQL out of the box anymore, so it's, it is MariaDB. Um, you can install MySQL if you want to, um, but that's what they get out, they give you out of the box from the repository. Um, to save some internet, what we did is we created those images, not just with Fedora, but already did the YAM ins install for MySQL and YAM install for Apache, um, just because I'll show you exactly where in template you add those lines. Uh, it, just imagine if all of you start doing YAM installs. Um, I mean, internet is finite, maybe. Um, so when um, you look at this template, so it starts with the description and, uh, well, the other really important part in template that you should never forget, because it's actually not gonna allow you to spin it up, is the template format version. It's an, uh, something you have to specify always. But um, there is three um, input parameters here, um, because even though we're not installing the MySQL server, well, MariaDB server itself, we're still creating databases there. So we are simulating the deployment of actual application. And uh, here you can specify the name user, so the database name to create um, the database user and the password. And um, in um, parameters, when you specify the input parameters, you can specify default values. Um, you could also um, specify allowed um, so create some regular expression to validate those input parameters. Um, and then there's going to be a really, really long part um, that is resources. So it's a definition of all the different resources. And um, so the two first ones are, it's um, something that allows heat to kind of talk to your instances. Um, when you start the instances and go to the log, you'll see um, that it does operations and SSH keys. Um, the important part here is the web server group. Um, so I mentioned that for auto scaling, um, you have to specify the group, which is a group of resources that you want to perform scaling policy on. So here, what we're gonna do is we're um, gonna have a Group of resources, minimum size two, maximum size two, because we always want to have two. Um, you can, again, depending what use case you're trying to implement, um, you can have different minimum and maximum. So for the actual scaling, um, when people use it to scale for performance, um, they have, um, typically they have different minimum and maximum here. So the, There is, the next one is um, scale up policy. If you, uh, what to do, what, that's a definition of the policy that's gonna apply. And then um, the instance down is basically salometer alarm description, um, what to do, what alarm to create in salometer. So if you look at the web server group, um, part of, what it does, it has this pro property called launch configuration name. So we are specifying the configuration we want to do, and then we're just referring to that configuration. And the configuration is specified um, here. <coughs> and um, what you can see, there is a metadata associated with it, and then um, the properties. So the properties, so the configuration we're doing is for this is um, creating virtual machines um, with the image ID Apache and the instance the instance type. So this is a this configuration basically consists of the web servers. Um, 
So the <coughs> this part, um, if you look at it, it's just a script. It's a bash script. And um, what this bash script really does is just creates the MySQL database. I remember I told you we already pre-installed MariaDB but, uh, on the images, but if you would want to make it happen, you can actually just add here a line saying yum install, something like that. Um, another use, so we, again, here uh, we're using CFN tools to do all the things. Um, one of the examples you can find for heat templates with triple O is where they're using Puppet to do things. Um, it's good and, I mean, Puppet obviously has a lot more features than CFN tools. Um, the problem is when you create the instances, you create them in private networks. So if you're running Puppet in a server agent mode where you have a Puppet server and multiple agents that have to contact the server for the instructions or the called Puppet manifest, they all have to be in same network. Or your Puppet server needs to be somewhere, so somewhere where um, it can reach the agents or agents can reach it. Since we're creating virtual machine and private network, um, what you have to do is pretty much spin up another VM that is a Puppet server. Again, if you look at um, um, example heat templates, um, you'll find where you can, they create the Puppet server first and then um, each of the images has just Puppet agent that talks to that server. And then the script that would be executed here is basically configuring um, Puppet Agent to where to talk to the server. Come on. Okay, so um, after we have two web servers, virtual machines, web servers, what happens here is um, we want to front end them with the load balancer. So those three are. Um, the three resources are related to load balancer. So the first one is creating the pool, just a group, um, and then the last one, the floating IP, that's the one that is uh, assigning the floating IP addresses to, so to the virtual IP of the load balancer. Um, I said I'm going to give you my opinions on things, so one of the things I don't like is um, in a lot of places when you use heat templates, you have to plug in the network IDs. Um, something that was changed, thankfully, in Icehouse is before, you, when you create the instance before Icehouse, you used to have to always use IDs, couldn't use name. So if you um, try to start a template in a tenant that has more than one network, it will just tell you, no, I can't. Um, you have to specify the network. So that was, um, that's some of the problems uh, with heat where when you use heat, you really have to know everything, how the you know, OpenStack is configured, what are the networks, what not. So it doesn't really provide this like ease of use for end user um, because end users ultimately don't really know what are the networks and where they should get this ID. Um, that's where a lot of other applications components come in that um, take care of those things. Okay, um, so the second part, um, this part is really similar to web servers, um, but it does same things on the database servers. Um, so it creates a database group, um, it launches to VMs, um, does a little bit more because it creates the databases um, and configures the databases to be accessible, so grants permissions for a user. And then we do the same thing with load balancer, um, just using a different port. So we just configure a load balancer for TCP 3306. And in the end, um, it provides the output of HTTP IP address, so that's where the URL of the website is. And that's um, something that is not really there. So, actually, let me. So I'll show. I'll show you for those of you who didn't get access to play around with it. I'll show you here. Um, so how that looks. 
and then look at the monitor of your neighbor. If your neighbor has horizon open, um, you should just kick him. So I want to do it too. So um, we we'll launch the stack. And uh, what we do here is we just plug in this URL. Um, so one again, another thing was heat is, um, heat is now really a repository for templates. So it kind of assumes that you store templates somewhere or have access to templates and then you can either plug in, like use a URL if it's a direct URL or um, you upload the file or you provide a direct input so you just type in there which is good for debugging small ones, uh, but you probably still want to use something to type them. And so you plug in URL. And you specify the stack name. And so this stack name is actually um, important because when Solometer <coughs> alarm gets created, um, that's something that gets referenced um, in metadata as well. So it's the stack name itself, um, I mean, you can specify any, but it's just a connection between um, several components. So I'm just going to leave the password user name by default, and I'm going to do lunch. And um, it's going to take some time to start. Um, so one of the other things, again, um, that uh, we are using version Icehouse here. Um, and there's a lot of work been done in Juno. Um, and I believe the next talk at 1230 actually touches that as well um, as permissions. So if you know how OpenStack works, um, to touch any API server, you have to be authenticated. And for this server to continue operations, it has to be authenticated and um, it has to um, kind of verify, validate um, your authentication token. Um, was heat? It's interesting because heat is trying to um, execute a lot of things on behalf of the user um, and it was this kind of idea was driving a um, feature in Keystone called Trust. Um, so if you do notice, like here are some talks about Keystone Trust, a lot of it is, like one of the use cases for that is actually using heat. Um, why am I talking about that? Because if you look, if you have access to Horizon, um, I am an admin because it's my user, but even your users, I actually had to give admin permissions because otherwise it wouldn't create some of the resources. So this is, again, something to know about. Some of the resources are totally fine, doesn't care, any user can do that, but not all of them. Um, so this is a pretty thing that got created. Raise your hands if you actually got access to Horizon and managed <coughs> to get same results. So um, we do have pretty powerful servers under it, um, but it's a limited number. Um, so it, creating, spawning the VMs and then applying um, things is, might take, but um, it should finish. Okay, <laughs> hmm. that is something I didn't see, but um, part of what I tried was um, creating 140 instances, and it took a while, but it actually finished all of them in the end. Um, so, hmm. it is surprising, but yeah, so this is um, a little monster. Um, and what you can see is a lot of resources are um, actually tied together. And uh, since there's a few people actually raised your hands, um, you can try and, again, go to this URL, plug in whatever, and get the environment. Because it doesn't seem that a lot of people actually try to do that. Um, you can see here, 
all the resources. You can also see the list of the resources and their status here. And it's slow. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to wait for that. Um, So when it's done creating, what you'll see here is the output, and there's like HTTP blah 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 floating IP. Um, it is pretty slow. Hmm. Somebody ate all the internet. Yay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Okay, so we're um, pretty much almost done. Um, so what's gonna happen is this all is actually gonna be up today. Um, don't trash it too much, okay? But um, you can try and come later. We'll see what's happening there. Um, and um, so you can do it later today. Um, you know where to get the environments if there are any free and uh, where to get the templates. So just come back later. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. How long would you expect to take? I'm, I'm reading your instance down. Uh, longer or up? Do both web instances have to go down before that last trigger to the instance down threshold? And how long would you expect it take to take the trigger to the far up another one? Um, so what happens was there was a question about the alarm. Um, so what happens with that alarm, it actually waits for the count, um, and uh, it's not really working correctly. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is, when you use something that annoys me is when you use the CFN and its scripts, which are Amazon scripts, it right. always sets the user to EC2-user. And if you're using a different file, you're not in EC2. I guess you have to hack the scripts to get it not to do that. Right. Um, so the other thing was... Um, CFN tools that kind of annoys me too is um, it always tries, so it tries to l look for your EC2 metadata and it's not always something that you have, you need to have because it can go, like you can use Nova API that provides metadata as well. Um, so I actually had to hack cloud in it a couple times. Well, not hack, you can, when you reinstall it, it allows you to like deselect EC2. Um, but yeah. I know what, and the problem is like, if it tries to connect to EC2 and it's not there, you sit there and wait for five minutes to instance to boot. Right, it's exactly the same thing. 
Yes. So I was like, oh, I have to end up with EC2 user or I go and have to hack the scripts and I don't want to right. maintain a script. Yeah, so. Um, uh, yeah, so there is a config file where you can actually modify a lot of values, including like uh, what to do. For example, like one of the things that changes the host name based on the VM name, um, so you can turn it off. Um, what else I used? Um, static IPs. So if you like, you can turn. So there's a config file. Um, it's it depends on distribution. It's under EC2. Look under uh, ETC. I'm sorry. Look for under ETC for cloud or CFN, or something like something related to any of those. Um, there's going to be a config file there where you can actually set like major things. There's not that much documentation about it. So you, again, you kind of have to like look at the code and. Yeah. Right. Yes. That might be helpful. I mean, we use standard images on all our cloud providers. So they have the tools there. It's just whether we bootstrap it differently depending on which cloud provider. It doesn't matter, I, I can look it up. So, yeah. so, so.